Good evening, everybody, and welcome to webinar 78. Tonight, we're looking at values and ethics, and it's one of our back to basics webinars. So I'm going to pass over to Siobhan because the chat is slowing down and I want to read what you're having for your tea. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think we've all been having a tough week. We're a bit low on numbers tonight because everybody's had a tough week. Kelly, your self-care today was a crisp butty, you, you know, so it must have been a tough week, I think, for all of us. So, um, OK, we're going to be doing back to basics, looking at um, values and ethics. As Kelly said, our back to basics are always really popular. Um, and we, I always say this, the, you know, uh, when we've done a back to basics on theory, I say things like, oh, theory is the foundation of our practice, the basic building blocks. But all of the stuff that we do in our back to basics are about the basic foundations of what we do as social workers. And values and ethics is the basic foundation or one of the basic foundations of um, social work. So I don't know if other people have been feeling very emotional today. I've certainly been feeling very emotional today, but it, it is um, two years ago today to this very day that we had the first lockdown in the United Kingdom and when you think about what's happened across those two years and today has been a national uh, UK day of remembrance hasn't it so we've been remembering people who we lost to Covid um, and perhaps that's been made us all uh, a little bit more emotional we're uh, we've been thinking about our very dear friend Paul Yusuf McCormack who we lost to Covid during the pandemic um, I saw something from um, a social care UK charity the other day that said uh, there were more than 900 social care workers who died through the COVID-19 pandemic and that we would be remembering them today. So um, just to start off with saying, you know, actually just giving some remembrance to that and thinking about uh, what's happened for people over the last couple of years and the loss uh, that lots of people have experienced, I think is important. But we're going to be looking at values and ethics tonight, and we're going to be doing it in our back to basics way. So nothing complex. We've done some webinars on values and ethics before. We had a, a webinar that was about ethics and values and was actually quite complex. There was a lot of academic content to it, and it was almost a bit, oof, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So we wanted to do something that just brought it back to basics, just brought it back to sometimes when you've got a hold of, there's a phrase that's used a lot in international social work, um, but the phrase is a small key can open a really large door. And sometimes you just find the simplicity in something and it opens up a whole range of learning for you. So tonight we're hoping that there'll be just maybe a small key that will help you to think about values and ethics in a different way. We know that we're often joined by students, but there's also practice educators who come and join us and very experienced social workers. And it's worth going back to basics when we're very experienced. Sometimes I really like going back to basics myself, even though I've been a social worker for 32 years, because it makes you think. Sometimes I love it when the team asks me questions that you might think, well, that's a, a really, you know, um, basic question but actually it really challenges me thinking about that so back to basics can be helpful for all of us so let's start the back to basics journey by thinking about what do we mean by values and I've done a dictionary definition here and I've not done this because um I wanted to be lazy and not do the typing out myself but I've done it as a screenshot from an online dictionary and the reason I've done it as a screenshot because we're going to look at both values and ethics in terms of dictionary definitions and the reason that I've done that is because it shows lots of different things really um, when you pull out the whole shot. So values, the thing about values as a word or value as a word is it can be both a noun and a verb and that's actually a, a starting point. So the noun is a naming word. How do we name something? So how do we name the values of social work? The values are basically about the worth of something or the usefulness of something, as you'll see from this definition here. It's about how important, how much value we give to someone, how much to something, how, how much worth there is. So all about the values of social work. What do we think? What do we see as being important? So we can have professional social work values, but we can have our own individual values as well. It's all about what do we think is important and naming that. So that's your noun. 
But then your verb is it's a doing word. So actually, in social work, we can do things bringing our values to life values-based working and we had a fabulous webinar with Caroline Aldridge on values-based practice on what that means and it's practice which is led by what we see as being really important what we think is important so it's important I think to just start off by recognizing values are really about what we think is important but it can be a naming word and a doing word. To go right back to basics, sometimes that's helpful to think about it in that way. So the word originally apparently comes from a Latin word, which means to be of worth or to be strong. So essentially in social work, values are about what we think is important, what we consider to be of worth, what we see as a strong influence on our lives and our belief systems. It's really about what's important, what really matters to us. That's our values. Everybody has values. And lots of people's values are different. Professionals, different professions have different values. Different professions see different things as being of great importance. So values can be owned by an individual, by a profession, by an organization. And we'll look at all of that and kind of put it together at the end. But essentially, values are about what we think is important. So if I asked you the question, and I'd like you to put this into the chat, and maybe some of the team will tell me what we're getting in the chat. If I said to you, OK, what are the values of social work? What do you think the values of social work are? then what would you say? What would you put into the chat about the values of social work? What do you think are the values of social work? So you tell me, put something into the chat and let's see what we've got going in the chat. This is why we like people to be able to attend live so that you can join in in the chat. You can add stuff in into the chat. So what can you see as the values of social work? To you, if I said, describe for me the values of social work, what would you say they were? Let's see what's in the chat. Kelly, is there anything going on in the chat? Let me know. What are people telling us in the chat are the values of social work? It's going really, really fast. I was worried for a minute we weren't going to get anything, um, but then everything all, all at once. So I'll just read the ones that I can at the moment. Um, okay. So somebody has said respect for human rights, social justice, equal access, relationships, um, trust, transparency, integrity and advocacy um it's going too fast understanding equality professional courtesy oh, treating it's... people with humanity um, oh, empowerment oh, respect for humanity i jump in a second <laughs> and hi highlight one that, um only one person said this is co-production um oh. and i think that's uh, that's an incredible little reflection yeah um sorry i just wanted to highlight that um but they're all wonderful i think kelly aren't they so Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah thank you thanks for highlighting that uh dave okay so uh lots of ideas there what i think is really interesting is nobody's mentioned or you haven't read out and of course we don't know because like you said everything was going really quickly but there's some things that i think are really really important in social work so if we define values as being what we think is of worth what we think is important to me some of the most important things in social work are kindness demonstrating love to others those things are really important and whenever I ask people what are the values of social work nobody ever comes up with those and I just think it's really interesting that things like I would say sharing now maybe co-production is a, almost an academic way of saying sharing in some ways but I would say things like sharing caring love kindness those kinds of things to me are really important in social work and yet they never get included in lists of values uh, um, in social work and there I know we, we've talked about this a little bit when we did the kindness webinar but to me those are some of the basic virtues that basically social work is built on those virtues that kind of social justice stuff it's all built on kindness and love and care and yet people don't talk about those in relation to values I think that's really interesting isn't it um I was doing um some reflective work with a group of, of social workers the other day and one of them said 
that she'd given um, somebody a hug and it really worried her. Have I done something wrong? Could I be accused of something? But this was a person who was very, very distressed. And to me, I was thinking that's a human being reaching out to another human being. But her concern was I might have breached values and codes of conduct. And what I think is where, where have we lost some of that? And fairly recently, another uh, new social worker said to me that her a team manager had said to her, you're too kind to be a social worker. And that floored me, that comment. I was thinking, what have we become when people are being told you're too kind to be a social worker? This is really worrying. And so when we talk about values of social work, I suppose I'm like, where do those things fit in? Where do things like caring about people and um, being kind and demonstrating love for people, which we know that, um, you know, the Care Experienced Conference of Care Experienced Adults in their top 10 things that they wanted. Number one was we want more love in the care system, which includes physical affection. And actually, that's, you know, really challenging for social workers. We've become almost, we've professionalised things so much that we've moved away from some of those fundamental things. But values, if values are the basis, how do values and virtues connect, I suppose, is the question for me. So, OK, if we go right back, this is um, Bystek's work. Now, what's really interesting is his work Bystex seven principles um, are said to be the foundations, if you like, the basics about um, from the 1960s, the real basic aspects of values. They're often taken as the basis of what we might describe as the social work value base. So these seven principles are often taken as the basis of the social work value base individualization so the person being treated as an individual being seen as an individual in their own right with a recognition that they're a unique individual purposeful expression of feelings so that bit where the person that we're working with is able to express their feelings we're able to work with those feelings and manage those feelings we've almost come up with whole academic um language around that about being emotional intelligence and how we use emotional intelligence but Bystack described it as purposeful expression of feelings and then controlled emotional involvement so the individual when they express their feelings should have a response from us which is sympathetic Bystack described it as I'm not sure I like that word but it's the way Bystack described it from an interested professional who adopts a certain level of emotional involvement so some level of emotional involvement, but a balance with some level of being able to manage that and sit removed from those feelings. Acceptance, so that the person is seen as a person of worth, a non-judgmental attitude, self-determination, so people should have the right to make choices and decisions and confidentiality. So this was all about the basis of a relationship between a social worker and an individual, but is taken now often seen as being, if you like, the sort of fundamental building blocks of what we talk about as values. It's important for you to know where these come from. This comes from a priest. Bystek was a Catholic priest. This comes from thinking it comes from a, a Christian background and it's thinking about where do these come from? What's the influence of these? And thinking about the links, the thing about things that are fundamental, things that are building blocks at the bottom, a bit like Lego building blocks. Everything builds on top of it. There are so many other things that connect. So many of the things that we've talked about in our webinars, like spirituality, like um, professional love, professional kindness, all of those things, they're all building on what we talk about in terms of values. So we've got a beginning understanding of values, but we're also going to just start to um, explore some of the issues around values. So when we do back to basics webinars, 
it's down to the team. We don't have a guest speaker that comes in. It's down to us and some conversations we have as a team and who's able to contribute at which, which sessions. So Brett's contribution was a question, wasn't it, Brett? So you're going to pose a question. I'm going to try and answer it, but I'm hoping some other people might join in. So maybe Kelly and Chris, maybe Tony can join in in responding to the question. If you're not too busy doing the social media stuff, Tony, but go on, Brett, give us your uh, question. OK, so my question for the team is like an ethical dilemma. So as students, um, we're taught about uh, not being um, judgmental, um, being unbiased um, and treating everyone as an individual. But how do you manage a situation where um, something just doesn't sit right with you morally and you're working with someone and you feel you can't work with that person um, because that doesn't sit with you right and an example I would give is a sex offender. Okay. So the question then you're posing then, Brett, is how, how can you work with something where and um, somebody where they've done something that you feel is morally challenging you? Yep. Okay. I like the, the fact that you've used the word morals because morals and values are they the same thing are they different things so even just the use of the word morals is interesting we've talked about a moral injury haven't we previously moral injuries being where um where you where you do something and that violates your morals or where you don't do something and that violates your morals so we're kind of almost here looking at it's teetering on the edge of would it be a moral injury to work with somebody who's a sex offender would it be there that you're looking at that moral stuff so there's a few thoughts i have i don't know what the um other team members would want to share um and i know you had a bit of a debate about this in discussion earlier so that i wasn't party to because i was busy doing something um but i could hear in the background so i've got a couple of thoughts one is i think that essentially as social workers we've got to be able to recognize that what people do can be separated from who people are so their behavior and who they are are not completely the same thing and that's how i think about unconditional positive regard i can have huge unconditional positive regard for an individual for that person because that person is a person and people matter their behavior might really challenge me. The things that they've done might really challenge me, but I can still work with that person as a person. That's the way I would think of it. However, I have never chosen to work in areas. I've, I've worked in um, forensic mental health services, for example. I've worked with people where they're, they've um, offended in the past in lots of different ways. Um, I've definitely worked with people who... Um, sex offended I wouldn't choose to specialize in a particular area such as that wouldn't be my choice but I know it is the choice of other people so they may have more expertise around that but I would say I would separate who people are from what people do and often there's a reason behind what people do and sometimes if we can separate out and understand that reason and externalize it rather than internalize it, it's something about the person's environment rather than something about the individual. If we can externalize rather than internalize, we've got a much better way, I think, of connecting and providing unconditional positive regard. There are always in social work forever going to be some people that you like working with. And there's going to be some people you don't like working with you. Some people, I think, Kelly, I mean, you can join in with me here if you want to. But I think you described it earlier as there might be people you wouldn't invite around for tea, but you've got to work with them. There's other people you'd like to invite around for tea, but clearly we can't because there are boundaries in place. So there's bits about there's always going to be some people you really like and there'll be some people that you don't like. It's important that we are conscious of that, that we feel able to talk about that in supervision. We're not trying to hide that. Don't say, I just, you know, everybody's, I see everyone. This, I think don't try and hide that because there will be some people that you do closely connect with and there will be some people that you find a bit irritating and don't really, you know, get on with them and I find them a bit annoying or whatever it is because you're a person and they're a person. But if you're able to connect with that, talk about that in supervision, that's really important. 
I have often found in my own practice, probably the people that I've not particularly liked, I've actually, because I've been conscious of that, I've probably done more with them and gone a bit further to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm almost overcompensating for that to make sure. Um, but it, this is a bit about you work with people and you've got to be able to, I think, work with anybody and be able to externalize what they have done and separate that out from who they are as a person. That That's my thoughts about it. What about other people? Is there anybody on the team? Is there anything? Di, it looks like you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Di, great. What are you going to say, I know. Di? So just extended it a little bit, because I was just reading some of the comments, and people are talking about stepping away from the behavior, et cetera, about what a person's done. What if it's not about what a person's done? What if it's about um, where it's to do with, your religion and you don't agree with their sexuality and um, that was an example so they haven't done anything that is their sexuality and you've got that issue with that that's extends it a little bit differently so so what do people sort of think you would do in that case if it really sits against perhaps your morals your religion and then you are sort of told that you have to work with these you know with, with, with these people you've not got something to step away from because it, they haven't done anything sort of thing so yeah. Yeah, yeah, just extended it yeah. that way. I think that's a really interesting point. And I know that's not something that you're suggesting is in your practice. I know yeah. it's like when you're talking about it. Um, Kelly, you've put your hand up there. So, but thank you for that, Di. I think that's really helpful. And I, I can come back on it, but maybe Kelly can come back on it. But I like the question. Thanks for that, Di. Yeah, on, I, I just um, I just wanted to follow up what Di was saying that, you know, that that I, I was thinking that I, I missed that in the chat, but I was thinking that because, you know, as as a gay person i've had to work with people and work alongside people who really don't agree with what they call my life so that kind of it's the opposite side of that isn't it um and i think for me a lot of if, if it's a if it's a religion thing or a cultural thing i think it's really important to remember that there are lots of um, lots of people from the same religion and same culture that have really vastly different views on things. Um, so I think that that's that's really important to remember. But you know, we can also experience things from the other side. People mm -hmm. may not want to work with us because they don't agree with what we do and prosper. Your connection's not very good. Similar in a, um, a training of work with. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, just, you know, we, we can experience things from the other side and that's really important to, to remember. It's not always what do we as social workers, who do we as social workers want to work with or not. It's sometimes people we work with may not want to work with, with us for various reasons. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really helpful um, comment that you've shared there, Kelly. And you're perhaps, I don't know if you'll share that, I'll share a little bit more about um, your experiences a bit later um, but it is a really interesting thing and I suppose I've gone at it of you can externalize somebody's behavior and then as you said sometimes for some people it's not about behavior it is about who the person is it is about that individual um, I would say there my view is that you have to separate that out you cannot come into my this is my view and maybe you know it's harsh I don't know but my view is you cannot come into social work if there is something about a person or a person's lifestyle or a person's choices that you are going to say, I morally disagree with and I'm not happy with that. I think you've got to be able to leave that um, and not bring that into your practice because people have should be able to make those choices and we should respect every individual for who they are. Um, I just think that's really important. And I think who somebody is, um, what somebody's done, you could find morally questionable. Who somebody is, I think, is really difficult to try and say, I'm going to find that morally questionable. Because then I'd just say, well, actually, we're people working with people and you've got to put that to one side. That would be my perspective on it. Um, but I know there are lots and lots of debates about that, aren't there, Di? And, and you've, I mean, obviously you can see the chat and I'm not looking in the chat because I'm finding it distracting. I'm also, though, seeing lots of people putting their hands up. So I don't know if that means you want to get involved put something in the chat, put a QA and a on. If we've got time at the end, we might see if we can pull some people in uh, to have conversations about anything that's been raised for you. But I suppose that's my perspective. So um, thank Tony, you for the Tony, question. Tony, Tony Lee had a hand up, Siobhan. Oh, sorry. sorry. I can't see. I couldn't see. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Tony. There's too many of us on the screen, isn't there? <laughs> 
Sorry, Tony. I've only got six cameras on at a time. Sorry, Tony. No, that's fine. I was just waiting for a segue to come in. Um, I totally agree with what you were saying, Siobhan. As you were speaking, I was just thinking, yeah, you can't really come into this if you have an issue with someone's way of life. Um, one thing I think is really pertinent is that when you come into social work and you're practicing as a social worker, you're taking on the social work ethics and values. It's no longer yours. And I think it's important to understand where your um, values and your opinions lie in is it ignorance is it culture is it where where are these opinions coming from um, and to challenge them as well and to know that regardless of how you feel even though that you need to work through that if it's you know judgmental to a person's way of life you ultimately have to take on the um, social work social work ethical values and um and yeah and and opinions because it's not about how you feel it's about what is basically in the basis of how, how to work as a social worker. Um, an example I have personally, um, one of my colleagues who was a Christian had a young person recently who wanted to get a termination. And from her Christian perspective, she spoke of th this in um, reflective practice and she said we could share it with other examples. This was for my university that I shared it with and she was be fine with me sharing it on this platform. Um, and she felt very um, conflicted as you know her personal beliefs for her type of Christianity that she practices um, doesn't allow terminations um, and she accepted that thought process but then she said as a practitioner I now need to take on the social work ethical values and do what's best within best interest of this client and she advised her how she would you know basically advised her according to the social work ethics and values um, which was something I found very um, it resonated with me because it really highlighted how our what we deem as morally wrong is very subjective um, and we have to almost have a basis as social workers is something that we've you know come collectively to, to to work by otherwise we might be working with people how we best see fit um, which is not necessarily always right yeah yeah thank you thanks for that Tony thank you for sharing that as you were talking I was reflecting thinking about how over the years because it's 36 years since I started my social work journey if you like since I started my social work training and over those years I've noticed that my personal values and my professional values have come more in line with one another and I think maybe earlier so I liked the way you described it as I think you said we've got to take those on and I wonder whether we become them sometimes and I have become them but maybe there will be times where people's personal and professional values don't align and we're going to look at that I've got a model for at the end we'll look at the hows how do we deal with some of the, the dilemmas that we're talking about now so thanks for the question thanks for the team's debates around it we need to move on I was saying we may you know but we now need to move on so Stephen Shardlow um, he says, really interesting, um, Stephen Shardlow, because uh, Mark Dole and Stephen Shardlow wrote something about around values that I've been trying to get hold of. And I remember the phrase and now I can't get hold of where the reference was. But they described values and students learning about social work values as being like a slippery fish. You get hold of them, you think you've got hold of them and it just slips away because it's like stuff that you just can't quite get a hold of because in different situations, you've got to debate it in a different way. But then later, Stephen Shardlow says, to ask continually what are the values of social work is to miss the whole point. He says, even though phrases such as the value base suggest that there is something firm and fundamental upon which we build the edifice of social work, actually there is, he says, no single set of values that commands universal assent amongst practitioners, educators or clients. So that's interesting. It even almost cuts across what you've just said, Tony, that there's almost like there is no universal agreement. We like to feel that we're confident and we're on firm footing and firm grounding. But actually, the thing about values is they are shifting a lot. They shift. Society's values shift. What people believe shifts over time. And so really saying we've got this firm value base, even the phrase value base, as though it's a base of something, can be tricky. But actually, it's I think it's ethics that give us the base. Values and ethics are different. Values is about what we think is important, if you like, where ethics are about what we do. Ethics are about behaviours, how we do something. It's a behaviour, a conduct. You'll see here again, I've used the screenshot from the online dictionary, behaviour, conduct. It's a branch of knowledge that deals with principles, but it's all about what we do with those principles. 
It's about our conduct, about our actions. And interestingly, and the reason that I decided to do it as a screenshot is, if you look at the bottom, if you look at the word that relates to it from Greek, ethos. Well, ethos is all about, that's a word that we use, isn't it? It's about our ethos, about our kind of way of thinking about things. And then etiquette. Etiquette is about behavior, isn't it? Etiquette is about, have you minded your P's and Q's? Have you behaved in a proper way? Have you stuck your elbows on the table? Whatever the etiquette is. So it's all about behavior. Ethics are essentially about how do we behave? How do we do things? So again, I think we can almost separate out our values and our ethics. So as Tony was telling us and giving us that little scenario, somebody might believe my belief is, my value is that terminations are morally wrong or sexuality, my values are this. But our ethics, our behaviour, the way that we respond, that's separate. Actually, what we do is separate. So I think it's not so much about separating out. Sometimes people will talk to you about separate personal and professional values. I think it's about values or about our thinking. Ethics are about our doing. Nobody can tell you how to think. But a profession can have standards of behavior that we expect. And I think that's the difference for me between what's a value and what's an ethic. And in terms of that whole thing about ethics or about our behaviors, then Di is going to tell us about behaviours in the apprenticeship, aren't you, Di? So as our apprenticeship representative, if you like, almost coming to the end of your apprenticeship now, Di. Almost, almost there. Almost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this is probably something actually that I maybe not never really sort of really thought about because we, we work very much to a different set of standards for the apprenticeship. We've got our set of standards, but we have also got all of these um, behaviours and again, it's linking very much to what you're saying there, Siobhan, about ethics are our behaviours and also the behaviours being the verb and the doing word. So it's very much about what we do. So sort of just reading some of them, it's about that communicating openly, honestly and accurately. So that is something we will do with people. We should be listening and applying our professional curiosity to evaluate and assess the information that we need to gather to provide that quality advice, support and care. Um, again, as people, our behaviour should be that we're sort of treating people with compassion, those we work with, that dignity and respect, working together just to empower that positive change. And again, another behaviour, again, what we're doing is about adapting our approach according to the situation and, and context and then committing ourselves to continuous learning within social work with curiosity and critical reflection. And obviously on the end, it's about the social working green standards. So alongside, even though our actual standards do evidence about ethics and values and there's a set of standards for that, we do we do have sort of these behaviours as an addition. And I don't know if they're sort of under the, I don't even know what the standards are, I've got so used to the apprenticeship ones, but you're, you, the ones that you use as sort of social workers on your ASYE, I don't know if you have sort of behaviours as a separate one, but it's just quite interesting that everything you said tonight actually really links into sort of that with the behaviours. Yeah, it is interesting. I, and of course, I, you know, the, the apprenticeship is, is, isn't something that I'm that involved in. And I find it interesting that there's this separate set of behaviours, you know, that is because actually it is about being able to separate out what I said earlier, separating out who people are from what they do. We can do that for ourselves, what we believe to what we do. You know, we can think about ethics are our behaviors so yeah that's in thank you for sharing those behaviors with us they're actually really interesting and really I think clear and even if we're not an apprentice you could look at each of those and think actually that is what social workers do that 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 should be behavior for social workers all over the world really shouldn't it so social workers behaviors is an interesting way of thinking about ethics mm -hmm. So if we go back and link it in, try and put it all back together, because in some ways, I think sometimes going back to basics is what does all of this mean? The what, why, how frameworks that I talk about a lot, and Simon Sinek has developed into this golden circle, he describes it as, with why sitting in the middle. I was thinking about this and reflecting on it, and I thought, in lots of ways, values are our what, they kind of surround us. If you look at the golden circle illustration on the screen here, the blue part, the values, what we think is important. The green part, the how part, that's how we live those values out. That's our behavior, that's our what we do. 
you know, how we do it, sorry. And then both of those are influenced by our why. Our why being our purpose, our mission, our reason for being. So why are you a social worker? Your values will influence why you are a social worker and why you are a social worker will ultimately influence your values. There's a circular connection between them. In terms of ethics, why you are a social worker will influence the way in which you behave. But more than anything, the way in which you behave influences is influenced or they're all connected they all connect together there's this circular connection between the what the why and the how so for me values are what we think what we think is important ethics is how we live that out ethics is about our behaviors so that's that's my thought on it we're going to go to kelly who is going to share what ethics mean you're going to share what ethics mean to you kelly aren't you we were saying earlier before we started Oh, it might be a shorter webinar tonight. And now I'm looking and thinking, we're running out of time. I don't know what's going on, Kelly. So um, are you there, Kelly? Because your connection's not been great tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I hope it holds out. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to share something about um, ethics and the philosopher Kant. Um, so this was something that I was aware of before starting social work course, but I didn't know I didn't know the name for it you know like when you you think something or you know how to do something and then you realize it's got a name so this is kind of where I was at um so for me it's always been really important that a person is a person regardless of um the situation that they're in or similar to what the guys have said earlier it's not about what a person's done or what they can do for you or how they live their lives it's about a person being a person independent of all that and being worthy of um of your time so as a social worker it's really important to me that I see every um, every interaction as um, as an end in itself not as as a means to an end and each person as um, being worthy of that attention so for me as for me going into social work it may be that um, the visit I'm doing or the call that I'm doing or some for the appointment that I'm setting up is is part of a bigger thing it maybe I'm trying to do an assessment I'm trying to gather information and um, but for that person if we switch around it may be the first time they've ever been in that situation um, and it's important to see it from their um, point of view so it's it's kind of for me that became really relevant when in my first year of study I unexpectedly um, became a foster carer um, it was a family member um, and it was a situation I didn't expect to be in but kind of alongside my studies I had to be assessed as a foster carer um, I had to have social workers kind of in and out of my house asking me very very intrusive questions on you know um, on my upbringing on my relationship with my parents on past relationships um, not really things that I wanted to speak about with people that I didn't know so for me it was really difficult and it, it kind of enabled me to see the other side of um being assessed and being being the subject of that um and during during the time of being a foster care i've experienced some really really good social work where people have had time and you know it's they've treated me with respect and um i've not felt like a cog in a machine and i've, I've experienced some really poor social work where i felt like completely irrelevant a bit like a pawn in a game of chess you know, and, and nobody's actually bothered about the visit or changing the time or um, not really listening. So f for me, kind of this type of ethics is really important because each person is is worthy of the support and the time that we give them, no matter whether we agree with them or what the end goal is, um, just to kind of remember all those little pieces. So that's been really important to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Kelly. I was just thinking as you were talking that if anybody's got the social work theory cards, then personhood on the theory cards is really helpful for understanding what you've just talked through there, really, and the fact that a person is always a person. And how do we maintain that personhood for individuals rather than dehumanising them and becoming a cog in a wheel or a pawn in a, a chess game, as you just described it? So thank you for, for that, um, sharing that with us, Kelly. OK, so in terms of thinking through ethics, and I'm not going to read out all of these, but I want to start to position things. So we know that a lot, of, we know all of us as a team, we're all based in the UK, across the UK. Uh, we have team members across the whole of the UK. But um, 
we know that a lot of the people who join us are working internationally and we've got quite a few people here from South Africa tonight I noticed in the chat earlier so let's just widen this out now there is a global social work statement about ethical principles and these are the nine ethical principles developed by the International Federation of Social Workers and the International Association of Schools of Social Workers. They've developed this statement of ethical principles for social workers, respect for the inherent dignity of humanity, promoting human rights, promoting social justice, promoting the right to self-determination, promoting the right to participation, respect for confidentiality and privacy, treating people as whole persons, ethical use of technology and social media, professional integrity. They're the nine. Now, what happens is that international statement of ethical principles is not a code, can't be a code because it's a statement of principles worldwide. Each individual country then develops its own code, its own code of conduct. Some countries call it or code of ethics. But all of those, every country that I've ever looked at, and I've looked at lots because lots of them are translated. And in the work that I did with the International Federation of Social Workers, I'd see lots of them all over. They're all pretty much drawn out of that original international statement of ethical principles. So if you think about going back to that original international statement, that's really helpful for you as students. Very often what students do is they look at their own countries. So, for example, those of you who are here in the UK, you probably go and look at the, Bas the Baswa Code of Ethics. You've probably got a copy of that. You can get hold of that for free. Probably a lot of universities actually give students a paper copy, don't they, at the start of their training. Lots of local authorities, lots of um, social work organisations have copies, physical copies. The Baswa Code of Ethics, it's all there. It's about the importance of relationships, assessing and managing risk, acting with informed consent, all of those there that are on that poster. I'm not going to go down all of them, but there's lots of the things that we've talked about tonight. But broken down into three main areas of human rights, social justice, professional integrity. So every country has its own code. But what I'm going to encourage you to do those of you, especially who are students, but everybody else too, is yes, look at the code, but then also go back to the International Federation of Social Workers. If you are writing an assignment or a reflection, or you're just thinking about ethics, look at the International Federation of Social Workers website. And specifically, sometimes people can find it, it can be a bit difficult to navigate if you're looking for something in particular. So go for the commissions, look at the International Federation of Social Workers commissions. In the follow-up email, we'll give you links to this. But look at the commissions and then look at the Ethics Commission. And what you'll find is they produce regular exceptional documents that you can access for free, often written in a really easy read way, often very quick off the mark, very responsive to what's going on. So as an example, then there's a whole series of ethical statements in relation to COVID. IFSW published this report on April the 7th. 2020. We'd not had COVID around for very long at all at that point, and yet that was published as information for social workers. It gave loads of really good advice at that point early in the pandemic about what could be done. So it shows that there's an immediate response into things. It was followed up with some guidance on um, practical guidance thinking about the challenges in July 2020 and further followed. So this was the, you'll see that there's, it's the same picture and it just changes colour. So we've got the blue one here is about the ethical challenges and taking an international perspective on that. And then that was in July 2020. And then it moved into giving ethical guidance for how to practice in the pandemic. And I've read some extracts from this for you before, but this is an extract that I think is really important for all of you to hear. 
about social work during the pandemic. Now, a lot of this is pulled together by Sarah Banks, who is a world leading expert on um, ethics in social work. Um, and so, you know, you might pay a lot of money to read books written by Sarah Banks, go on to IFSW and there's tons of stuff there. It gives you a primary resource. It, it's, um, it's free to download. This is a really rich area for you to go mining information about ethics. So in the introduction to this document, Sarah Banks says this. She says, look, social workers have been working tirelessly during the COVID-19 pandemic not just to deliver much needed social services, but to do this as respectfully, compassionately and fairly as possible. So pulling in the ethics, you know, respect, compassion, fairness. And then she says, practicing during pandemic and crisis conditions is extremely challenging. It unsettles old priorities. And so it requires a reassessment of what might be ethically right in new circumstances. At times when social workers are at their most stressed and isolated and when fast responses are expected, the importance of slow, careful, ethical deliberation is never greater. This guide draws on social workers' accounts of their real life ethical challenges and responses to offer some pointers for social workers to consider. We hope you'll find the time to read it, reflect on the issues raised and contribute new ideas and recommendations as circumstances and practices evolve. There's some key things in this guidance. It talks about being pushed into making fast responses, but that's when more than ever, we need slow, careful, ethical deliberation because you can get pushed into, particularly by governments and by politics, you can be pushed quickly into doing something that later you think, I don't know if that was the right thing to do. So we need to be able to deliberate things. We need to be able to talk to our colleagues. That's a key element of ethical practice is not just what do I think is right, but what do we think is right because this is about shared decision making and ethical practice and so as this document says people have been working tirelessly during the COVID-19 pandemic and there have been lots of ethical dilemmas along the way so our uh, very own team member Chris is going to tell us about her working through the pandemic and some of the dilemmas and ethical dilemmas that you faced in terms of decision making during the pandemic aren't you Chris? Yeah thanks Siobhan yeah funny enough um, I was just thinking about how what um, Sarah Banks' statement says is actually making me reflect on it right now so today I, I wanted to bring an example of how ethical decision making is not always clear cut and it can be really tricky to find the right decision for somebody and today I've actually been working with somebody who's um, a very elderly person and their situation at home has changed and they have actually now need a care home placement and the options that are available to me for this individual are either hugely far away <clears throat> because um yeah that's what the search has brought back and and a, a reasonable place or closer to home but actually somewhere that isn't quite meeting the standards to the to the level that I would want them to be the complexity with this is this this particular individual's family don't drive and so to get to the place that's meeting all the standards and is good is going to be really difficult like almost impossible because I live in a very really rural place and there's no public transport so my ethical dilemma is the fact that I'm either faced with the prospect of providing somewhere really good for this person but actually they wouldn't be able to see their family who they're really close to or putting them somewhere that they are close to their family but potentially they're not going to get the care they need and actually listening to what you're saying about Sarah's statement and about, you know, the situation's urgent, but actually I need to take the time to reflect on it and to be slow and deliberate and really make the right ethical choice on this because this particular lady's not able to say what, you know, what her preference is. 
and you know she's relying on me to get it right and I just wanted to kind of say actually these things are not always clear-cut and sometimes the answers that are out there actually we don't really want any of them <clears throat> I'd like to pick one place up and put it next to where she lives but that's not possible and you know it makes me think sometimes you hear about you know organizations making kind of blanket decisions about something they'll provide or not provide or um you know a particular service perhaps that they say oh well you know we're not going to provide that anymore and you just think I, I kind of always feel like I need to challenge that because as you said earlier it should be about the individual and the individual's needs and what is best going to suit them not about a policy decision or you know something that we kind of say actually oh well we don't do it that way you know we need to be open-minded exactly someone's put in the chat resource led not needs and it is frustrating but i think ethically we need to put ourselves in a place as social workers where we're prepared to say actually that doesn't sit with my value base and it's you know it's important that we hold true to the to the value base and that we challenge those decisions and and make the point that actually because that's what we're trained for you know that's our jobs our job is to do that so we need to uphold the rights of those individuals their human rights and actually support that yeah thank you for that chris i, I think you're quite right that often ethical dilemmas are about where there's almost no singular right answer and and how do we do that but you know, I, I do think what Sarah Banks said there is really helpful. And Sarah Banks also did something for Baswa at the start of the pandemic that I found really helpful that was called Slow Ethics. And it was like a little document that you pulled out of the PSW magazine. And it was just about slow. Just, just sometimes when we're rushing, that's when the danger stuff happens. And you yeah. can feel like you're under so much pressure to do things, but that's when we do need to go even slower sometimes. So, yeah. and that's where it connects, doesn't it? Like those Lego bricks we talked about earlier, it connects into the reflective stuff we've talked about, to the theory that we've talked about and bringing in holistic decision-making. So thank you for sharing that, Chris. And I know that you will think that through very carefully. Yeah. Well, I've got a few days off now, so I've got a little bit of time to reflect on it. and. Um... You know, and actually, by the time I go back, there might be another option available. Who knows? Let's hope. We can always Let's hold hope. hope, can't we? Yeah, Let's hope. absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. OK, so um, this is what that document identifies as some of the key challenges of working through the pandemic so that you can see here. Um, I'm just thinking I was I was going to say I won't read them out because people can see them, but lots of people tell me they listen to the webinars afterwards. So maybe I do need to read them out. So this is what IFSW said are the key challenges of working all over the world through the pandemic. People without access to technology or the skills to use it or those who lose contact could be unable to access services. Threats to privacy from home-based ICT systems which might not be reliable or secure. Difficulties in ensuring privacy and confidentiality because conversations can be overheard. Difficulties in making fair assessments of people's needs and living conditions when we can't see them in their own home environments. Difficulties in creating empathy and building those trusting relationships when we're not seeing people face to face. Problems in maintaining the boundaries between our personal and our professional life. So Chris, do take some time off as well with your leave that you were talking about. Don't be thinking about work all of the time. And uh, if face to face meetings do occur, the use of face masks and physical distancing can be a problem. What I think is really interesting here is this is highlighted. Look, these are dilemmas that all, all social workers all over the world are facing. We've got these shared dilemmas. So let's come together and create some shared ethics for working with these. Now, in the same way, in the United Kingdom, most definitely, we are facing austerity. We've got a social care crisis. We've got a looming cost of living crisis. Massive issues going to be occurring around poverty and access to services. 
social workers are going to share some really difficult experiences. It's a crisis condition. It's not a pandemic, but it's a crisis condition. And maybe what we need to be doing is coming together and talking about here are the shared experiences. Let's have some shared ethics around this. So I think this ethical guidance that the International Federation offers is really helpful. And then the final version of this document or the latest version of this document is in a kind of sandy colour. And this is a specific resource for social work students, educators and practitioners. And what this does is it goes through a number of real life scenarios. So a little bit like we've, you know, had some real life scenarios shared very confidentially, but shared tonight. This shares again confidentially, but some real life scenarios all over the world, enabling family contact with nursing home residents in Spain. It talks through hospital social workers breaking the rules to help family members in Nigeria. We've talked about one of those in our webinars, I think. Balancing human rights and disease control in a domestic violence shelter in Hong Kong. Handling suicidal calls without support in Puerto Rico. Deciding whether to place children in foster care in an emergency in Italy. Preparing to discharge an older man from hospital in Brunei, deciding whether to challenge racism in the UK, deciding not to do a home visit in Slovenia, deciding whether to purchase and deliver essential items to families in need in the USA. It goes through all of those and it shows the dilemmas that social workers face. And then it talks through how do we find an answer to these sometimes almost in appearance unsolvable issues. But it offers a threefold framework. It offers a decision making framework. And I said to you at the end of tonight's webinar, we'll look at the how stuff. We'll look at the OK, how do we make ethical decisions? And we'll look at how do we balance value conflicts? And so we've got three different frameworks here that I'm going to talk through. This one from the International Federation of Social Workers, I've summarized it on the slide. I would encourage you to go and look at the original. But this talks about ethical practice and the three stages that we need to make and really very much what Chris has just shared with us. How do we maintain that ethical vigilance? And Chris, you were clearly showing that you've got this ethical vigilance in the challenge that you were just sharing with us. It's all about being alert and sensitive to the ethical dimensions of practice, particularly when we're under pressure, when we are exhausted. And let's face it, at the moment, all of us are exhausted. Think about our own stress levels. And that can give a tendency to fail to see infringements of rights or potential harm. It can mean sometimes we make judgmental comments. It means sometimes our value base is challenged. Ethical reasoning is about deliberating how to balance the different needs, rights, responsibilities, risks. How do we weigh up the harms and benefits? All of that reasoning that you were just talking through with us there, Chris, that we can, you could almost see it in your mind, that reasoning it through, judging what's the right approach, what's the correct course of action and being able to defend the decisions that you make. Because of the new risks that we face now, because of reduced services, we might need to change the way that we where we place the weight. You know, we might need to place more weight on public good and safety and minimizing health risks than we might do in usual circumstances. And then ethical logistics, the document talks through how we can work strategically and practically to act on the ethical judgments that we've made, even within the constraints of politics and organizations it's actually a really useful framework and those of you who are writing essays on values and ethics I would say to you, you must look at this because this is the current very contemporary guidance the thing about looking at documents created by organizations like the International Federation of Social Workers is they're much quicker to get out there than books are you know they can be written and they can be up online very quickly and this is really good peer-reviewed created by an international ethics committee of experts so take a look at that that could be a helpful framework another way that's an ethical framework another way of thinking about values is this is um, something that I've used for many years and I think I started to develop this for myself as a reflective tool at recognizing all of the different value systems that can be in play in a situation I can remember actually now I'm thinking about it now. I remember where I was sitting when I drew this up on a piece of paper, trying to really grapple with something that was going on in a piece of work that I was doing. 
with my for myself I was really trying to grapple with it and I came up with a daisy and so some of the images in the slides tonight have been images of daisies and that's been a pointer towards this I use a values daisy if you've got the reflective practice cards this is a prompt on one of the cards to get you to reflect on a situation and it's basically a way of looking at the way that there are lots of different value base values in place um, in any situation. So what we've got is you've got your own personal values about a situation. The values that we hold as an individual. And as we've already talked about and some of the things that have been shared, particularly around things like religion and faith, they can be shaped by religion, by faith, by our upbringing, by our understanding, by our education can be experiences, all kinds of things will impact on our personal values. They're the values that we hold as an individual. But then there is this professional value base that isn't quite as solid and standard as we'd like to think, as Stephen Shardlow says, it's not as solid and standard, but there are values of social work. And they're the things that are expressed in some of the professional codes and the standards that we've looked at tonight, the professional value base of social work. But then you've got organisational values. And this is when I was really starting to grapple with it. When I was a newly qualified social worker, I really felt that the values of the profession and the values of the organisation that I was employed in were the same. I completely felt that. But I, and you know, 32 years ago that I was a newly qualified social worker. But I'd say maybe three or four years in, I started to feel like the organisational values were very different to the professional value base and had become more about the management of money and had become more about ticking of boxes and gathering of data than the values of being there for people. And so I started to try and separate some of this out and pull out organizational values. But then I realized there's another thing at play here and that's society's values. What does society think is important? And they shift and change. Often they're expressed in the popular media. Look at the you know pages of the newspapers. They express almost societal values or maybe they influence societal values. The relationship between those two, I think, you know, the, the media and societal values is questionable. But you've got all of these different values. You've got personal, professional, organizational, societal values. And then I tried to put this together and then I was starting to think, OK, in this particular scenario that I was grappling with at the time which was a really difficult dilemma that I was dealing with I was thinking but there's not just my personal values there's also the personal values of the family and the service user there's also the personal values of the other professionals involved like the CPN and there's also their professional values and my professional values there's all these different things at play there's hundreds of value systems in this scenario and then trying to just understand those and see them and trying to find where is the connection and where is the disconnection helped me to create an argument that other professionals understood and would agree with because we started to look at where we had an overlap. And so just using a values daisy, I think can be helpful as a reflective tool. So I wanted to introduce that one tonight as well. And then the final one is one that is nothing to do with social work. But I found this image and I really liked it. And then I started to read a bit more about it and I thought, actually, I really like this. Now, some of the examples that are given in the blog, because it's a blog about being a dentist, it's about being a new dentist and thinking through the ethical dilemmas of dentistry. It was quite interesting when I read the blog because I've never thought about the ethical dilemmas of being a dentist, if I'm honest with you. But there were lots of ethical dilemmas in this blog about dentistry. But what I found really helpful was the way they used the word ethics, but spell out a bit of a thinking framework. And I just thought, you know, this is actually really helpful to think about. We need to evaluate the facts. What are the facts in this situation? And then we really need to think about the conflict that's presented. Because ethical dilemmas come up where there's some kind of conflict, whether it's conflict between people or between services or between what you can offer, or but there's always a conflict. 
So think about the conflict that's presented and then think about how many principles they've said apply. But think about how you bring in the code of ethics. How do you bring in the values of social work? That would be the how for me. Then identify applicable codes and code sections, compare the different options. If I did this, maybe the consequence would be that. If I did this, the consequence would be that. Compare all of the different options that you've got, weigh them up, and then select the best option under the circumstances. I just think it's a really simple but clever way of helping us to think about how do we behave in an ethical way when we've got all of these dilemmas. So I thought I would conclude with that one, with thanks to the um, new dentistry organisation that I took it from, but you can go and take a look at it there. So it just shows how we can sometimes draw on things because tonight was a back to basics. So it's about looking for something simple and this provided something simple. So it's 10 past eight. We've got a few minutes uh, that we could still use. I don't know if this is because I've not been looking in the chat. I've noticed a few people putting their hands up. Sometimes I don't know if that's about people agreeing or sometimes I don't know if it's about people wanting to speak. So if anybody did want to speak or you want to make a comment or you want to put something, now is the time. Um, I can't see any questions. I've just opened the q and I can't see any questions tonight. But is there, has there been anything going on in the chat that we need to think about or explore or that would be helpful for people is there anything that people want to put into the chat now i really feel like you've not covered this or can i just ask a quick question or is there anything that people would like to do on tonight's session before we conclude the session for people I would ask you then to use what we often use and we often refer to there's the um the method that comes from the University of York about how we conclude something in a reflective way. I would ask you to reflect on the session tonight, uh, a back to basics using the four words, surprises. Anything surprised you tonight? I've certainly been surprised by the fact that I could use something about becoming a dentist in social work. I'm terrified of the dentist, you know, but that, that would be a surprise for me tonight. So what's surprised you? Any surprises? And are there any satisfactions from this evening? Are there any dissatisfactions from this evening? And is there any learning for you from this evening? So those four words. Now, I use those a lot in my own practice. When we had the webinar about how to keep reflective journals, that was one of the things I said. It's a really good check out. It's a good way of checking out of something, but taking your learning forwards. So to check out of the session tonight, try using those four surprises, satisfactions, dissatisfactions and learning, because that can help to reset things for us ethically when we've been ethically challenged by something. So thank you for joining us tonight. We've just got, I think, two sessions left this season. Then we've got a few weeks off. I'd say off, but actually it won't be off. It will be us planning and getting everything put together for the next season because, you know, we're all busy social workers and we do this in our own time. So we do need a couple of weeks just to catch up after the, this season. I think this is, is this season four, guys. Are we doing season five next? Yep. So uh, we'll start season five back on the 27th of April. That's why we were asking you earlier, are there any topics that you would like us to do? Next week, Dave and uh, Mary Carter, who was one of the original members of the Social Work Connect team, are leading on the webinar that we're having next week called To Share or Not To Share. It's going to be um, care experienced social workers and I think social work students as well. They're talking about whether they share their care experience or not. Um, and bringing, I think, building on some of those ethical dilemmas, because very often there are ethical dilemmas around what we share. So that's next week. And then the final session of this season, we got, we've got into a bit of a habit now of doing an A to Z, which is another way of doing a back to basics. But we look at a particular topic and we give you an A to Z of that topic. We've done theory, we've done reflection, we've done anti-oppressive practice. And this time we're going to do an A to Z of social work skills. You're very welcome to join us um, in those sessions over the next couple of weeks. And we hope you will. And I think the team will be putting the links into the chat now. 
So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hope you could, you've got something that you can take out of it, maybe that you can take into supervision with your practice educator or you can use in an assignment, those of you who are students. Thanks ever so much for joining us, everyone. Bye.